I'll make a real quick video going over the six top attacks that I get upon myself. That you're going to hear. Um, you type in my name and you see, you know, Brian Nenlinger exposed, uh, you know, all these different things. Uh, the six top attacks that you're going to hear, I'm going to give a quick little rebuttal to each one of them. Number one, the biggest one that you're going to hear is that Brian Denlinger teaches Lordship Salvation. Because uh, I say repentance means you're changing your mind about your self. You, there's, there's no more self-righteousness. You're not looking at yourself saying, I'm a good person. You know, you change that. You say, I know I need a change in my life. You know, that's what we call repenting of sins. It's not that you have to turn from every single one of your sins. That is Lordship Salvation. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. But, you know, I teach there's repentance where you say I'm not. You give up that self-righteousness, you know, like the, the uh, publican that comes and he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He understands that he's a sinner. Somebody understands that they're a sinner. Then they come to the cross, okay? That's the whole point there. That's where Lordship Salvation, people will say, well, you teach Lordship Salvation because you teach that there has to be, you know, a changed mind towards sin and stuff. Well, sure. Yeah, but that doesn't, Lordship Salvation, true Lordship Salvation, let me explain that, is you have to make radical changes in your life and then you eventually merit salvation. And if after your salvation experience, you have some kind of sin or whatever else, well, then that proves that you didn't repent enough. <laughs> so you have to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and you, you know, he, he eventually grants you repentance. It's kind of a Calvinistic system uh, way of doing things. John MacArthur's big on the whole Lordship Salvation thing. Um, I don't teach that. Okay, I've dealt with Christians that have pornography problems, pornography addictions. I've dealt with Christians that have, you know, had all kinds of sex perversion types of issues and things, carnality issues, Christians that have a hard time giving up cigarettes, Christians that have a hard time with alcohol, Christians that have all kinds of problems. Um, and I don't say... I don't think that you made it. You know, for me to say, I don't know if you're really saved, I have to hear that there's a testimony there of this easy believism thing where you just, I prayed a prayer back when I was a kid and I thought, I think I'm saved or whatever. We need to know for sure, you know. And I'll judge people on the spiritual grounds too. You get somebody that hates the King James Bible, I say, don't think the Holy Spirit's there. And you get these people, we're going to go through the tribulation. We need to. The church needs to be purified. I'm going... Okay, uh, the church is pure by the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, yeah, but we're going to need more persecution and things to make us pure in the future. Huh? You know? <laughs> uh, well, you might, but I don't need any more persecution. I've had enough already. All right, so I don't teach Lordship Salvation. People, again, they'll, it's the same thing as Calvinism versus Arminianism. Arminianism, they'll say, are you a Calvinist or, or an Arminian? You have to be one of the two. No, I'm neither. Bible-believing Christian. Um, weird, weird stuff. Are you Lordship Salvation or Easy Believism? You know, do you believe that there has to be a whole bunch of works before you get saved and then God grants you repentance after He sees, sees that you've cleaned your life up? Is that what you believe, Lordship Salvation? Or do you believe that it's just a simple belief and you have to pray? Or maybe you don't even have to pray. You just get saved based upon your own feelings or something. I'm not, I'm not either one, you see. Uh, true conversion is you're ending the self-righteousness. You say, hey, I'm a sinner. I need help. I want out of this life. Believe what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and then the process of, you know, and, and call upon his name to be saved. He'll save you. Come to him in an act of faith. And then from that point on, your life of sanctification begins. You're called to be saints through sanctification. All right. That's not lordship salvation. Lordship salvation is there's continuous works and then God eventually grants you repentance and salvation because you've cleaned up your life. No, 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 no. You realize you're a sinner, get saved, and then God cleans up your life. And that process might take a while. But, you know, you're going to have some spiritual discernment that comes there because the Holy Spirit of truth moves into your life. That's not Lordship salvation, brethren. That's biblical salvation. So don't believe somebody comes out and says, Brian Nellinger teaches Lordship salvation. And what they'll do is... These people that expose me in their videos, they'll cut my videos up and they'll cut things and make me say things I'm, I'm not saying and I didn't mean and whatever else. And they, and they just wait just for any little time I slip up and say something a little bit off or whatever. And, then, and they'll just like make a whole big thing out of that. Because they're liars. But uh, number two, 
uh, the next big uh, attack on me is that Brian Denlinger is a racist. Um, I'm not for interracial marriage. You know why? Because I want to see black people in the future. Okay? I, I love black people. I love Chinese and Japanese and British and German and Italian. And I love people. Okay? I love to see diversity. But if everybody's intermarrying, guess what? Within a couple generations, you're not going to see pure black people anymore or pure Italian people or pure German people or pure Chinese or pure whatever. You know, I mean, I heard of a guy here recently. I was, you know, do a lot of different research on things. And this guy had this rare heirloom corn that was sort of a native uh, plant here in America. And he didn't grow any other types of corn in his garden the one year because he wanted to just grow this one type of corn. Because, he, see, if he had grown other types of corn, the bees would have pollinated between the different types of corn and they would have, he would have gotten a hybrid, natural hybridization. So what do you do when you want a pure strain of corn that's rare and almost extinct? You segregate it. And again, who, who made up the anti-miscegenation laws that America was under for hundreds of years? You know, people don't ask those questions. And why is it that uh, this uh, black woman, the Loving versus Virginia case, the two Jesuit trained lawyers, you know, overthrew the anti-miscegenation laws here in America. Why is it that she came out just recently, not too long ago, and she said that it's great that when we overthrew the anti-miscegenation laws, it paved the way for uh, gay marriage being legalized. Hmm. How about that? They don't like to talk about that. And again, the thing of racist, uh, this, this racist thing. Racist means you're trying to eliminate a race. You think that you're superior than somebody else and you're trying to eliminate them. I'm not trying to do that. All right? I'm saying I want to preserve unique cultures and distinctions and things. And I've said this question before, another little food for thought thing for those out there that uh, say I'm a racist because I'm for, for segregation and I'm against interracial marriage. Uh, how does the Antichrist kingdom come about? By bringing all the countries and diverse peoples together or keeping them separate? Think about that one. Attack number three that you're going to hear against me is that Brian Dunlinger is a hyper-dispensationalist. Okay? Ask them, whenever you hear that, ask somebody and say, okay, what is a hyper-dispensationalist? Define it for me. They'll say, well, he teaches different plans of salvation. Um, that's not the hyper-dispensational stand. Anytime somebody calls myself or Peter Ruckman a hyper-dispensationalist, you can mark it down right away without going into any further debate with that person that they have no clue what they're talking about. There is a difference between dispensational believing and hyper-dispensational believing. Okay? Let me show you. Uh, let's see if I have the book here. Oh, right here. This is one of the most famous uh, books on dispensational teaching that's ever been written. The Greatest Book of Dispensation on Dispensational Truth in the World by Clarence Larkin. I have some big issues with this book, but this is a dispensational book. Not hyper-dispensational. Dispensational. This book up here is another good one. This is One Book Rightly Divided by Douglas D. Stauffer. I don't have the cover on this one, but, you know, I think he's rewritten this thing or something now. But another book by a dispensationalist. He's not a hyper-dispensationalist. All right. Uh, let's see if I have the... Yeah, here. Here's Peter, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman's book. How to Teach Dispensational Truth, Not Hyper-Dispensationalism. Okay. And he has parts in here about... Uh, hyper-dispensationalists, and he goes into some of the, the stuff, you know, about them. Just saw it here, I'm just pacing through. Okay. This is the basic theological misconception that underlies all the works of Bullinger, Stam, I'll show that in a minute, Baker, Watkins, Jordan, Moore, O'Hare, and others. It produces hyper-dispensationalism. We are not hyper-dispensationalists. Do you understand? Right there. Peter Ruckman condemns hyper-dispensationalism. Here's his little booklet that he wrote on it. 
Hyper Dispensationalism by Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. This guy here is the hyper dispensationalist. He's just whacking the bread of life up and he's blindfolded. Perfect description of some of these nuts. Okay, I have Cornelius Stam's book. So I understand the hyper dispensational position. What these guys do is they say the ministry of Paul and even parts of Paul need to be cut out. Romans chapters 9 through 11. Paul is writing to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not written to us. That's why they'll deny prayer, uh, calling upon the name of the Lord. They'll, they'll mess with that. They'll say, that's not written to us, or you don't have to do that, or whatever. They're hyper-dispensationalists. I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. A hyper-dispensationalist believes that there are two bodies. Peter, James, John, you know, that's the one church, or the one body, excuse me. And then the from Paul until the rapture is another church. That's what these people believe. Um, they'll, they'll call themselves all different kinds of names, and it just gets really confusing. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a bunch of ridiculous nonsense, quite frankly. Uh, let me show you a verse very quickly. Uh, this is a great, great one to just debunk this whole hyper-dispensational thing, that there's two bodies of Christ you have. The early part of the book of Acts, they're in one body and, you know, they're preaching a different gospel there. And they were because it wasn't, the gospel was not fully revealed until Paul showed up. I understand that. But it's a time of transition. It doesn't mean that they're in a different body, right? That's nonsense. How do you know? Romans chapter 16, verse 7. Salute Andronicus, Paul writing here, and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Right there, in Christ before me. Okay, so I'm not a hyper dispensationalist. I know Brian Moonan came out and called me a hyper dispensationalist, and I think Andrew Snake and some of the others have called me a hyper dispensationalist. Uh, they're just proving their ignorance, is all that they're doing. I'm not a hyper dispensationalist, I'm a dispensational preacher. Okay, and you can watch some of the studies on that if you don't understand what that means. Um, Another one that you'll hear is uh, they'll say, Brian does not go to church. Um, they'll say that, and even though it's funny because you just watch some of my older videos, you'll see me in a suit and tie in a church building preaching. Uh, Country Chapel Baptist Church in Eldred, Pennsylvania. I was, you know, essentially like the right-hand man there for a while. I filled in for the pastor. I've preached many, many times in pulpits of Baptist churches, you know, and so I guess I was saved then, but then when I left that whole Babel building thing, now I'm not saved and I'm a false prophet or something. You know, uh, they act like I've never been inside of a church building sometime. I was raised in that stuff. All right. But here's the whole point. Brian Enlinger doesn't go to church. Okay. Neither does anybody else in the New Testament. Show me one verse of scripture that says go to church or go to a local church. That's another fun one. Where does the Bible say local church? King James Bible, show me one verse. You know, and I've offered a $5,000 reward. I'll offer you a $50,000 reward to show me one verse of scripture that has local church or tells you to go to church. See, see the average person, just to say it very clearly here, they'll say you should go to church. And what that means is there's some special place that you go to that you're in church when you get there and you wear your special outfit and you do your special things and then when you leave you're no longer in church that's not what the bible teaches the bible teaches that the church is the body of believers you're in church all the time church is the body of christ so is there ever a time when you're not in the body of christ no is there ever a time when you're not in church no it adds a whole new concept doesn't it and I, you know, people say, well, you're against going and meeting other Christians. No, I'm not against that. I'm not against that. But don't adopt the pagan ways of Roman Catholicism with the whole holy temple and the big phallic steeple on the top and everything else and patterned after Greek Parthenon and all this other stuff. You want to meet other believers in a park someplace or you have one of them has a barn and you say, let's meet together there and let's read the Bible together and sing hymns together and stuff. Fine, fine. Do it. Absolutely. But when you are going and you're practicing the same pagan stuff that the Catholics do, and they got their church buildings from the pagans, by the way, sanctifying paganism, historical fact, Constantine did that, took a lot of the Roman gods and made them 
Christian gods and things. I mean, again, I've, I've got so many studies on this, it's, it's ridiculous. So, does Brian go to church? No. How can I go to something that I'm in all the time? And I have gone to church buildings, by the way, so they can't say, you know, they say, Brian Dillinger doesn't go to church. Well, I have. So, uh, number five, the fifth big attack that you'll hear on me is that Brian Dillinger is paranoid. He thinks everybody but him is a Jesuit. Uh, well, that's not true. I mean, um, I don't think my son is a Jesuit. My wife might be. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. These people are so ridiculous. I mean, again, I will, I will clearly say, I believe so-and-so is a temporal, a temporal coadjutor, you know, which means a helper in physical, the physical type of realm there, a Jesuit temporal coadjutor. I believe Stephen Anderson is one. He's not an openly professing, you know, Stephen Anderson SJ or something like this. No. But you look at what he's doing, you look at the agenda that he is part of and the, the way that Jesuits do things. Eric Phelps, I mean, the world's authority on the Jesuit order, and he's like, yeah, I think Stephen Anderson is a, a Jesuit temporal coadjutor. Okay, they go through certain types of training, they get contacts with people, and they're told what to do, what to say. They're put in specific situations and things. They help out the Jesuit system. They help out getting to that, that uh, goal that the Jesuits will have. All right, so... Again, and, and, you know, and the other thing is, too, I'll, I'll actually show in different studies where the Lord will actually show us people's connections to the Jesuit order. And some guy doing something, and you go, you look it up. Like I said earlier, the, uh, the two lawyers that overthrew the um, uh, anti-miscegenation laws here in America, the federal, on the federal level, uh, the uh, Loving versus Virginia, and when they overthrew it, you know, I mean, you can look it up. The one guy's name is Cohen. I forget the other guy's name. They're, they're both Jesuit educated. And again, we showed in other studies where the Jesuits themselves say, if you've been to one of our retreats, if you've attended one of our schools, if you are a actual practicing Jesuit, whatever, you're all Jesuits. You're all within the Jesuit family. We call you Jesuits. So the Jesuits themselves say, if somebody's been to a Jesuit school, they're a Jesuit. Again, I show, you know, James White's book over there in different studies, Norman Geisler. He went to Jesuit schools. I say, the guy's a Jesuit. People go, oh, you're paranoid. You're crazy. You know? So, do I think everyone is a Jesuit? No, I don't. I think people, some people are just genuinely wicked, you know? And, you know, I don't think that everybody else is lost and I'm the only one that's saved. You know, I don't think that for one second either. And the sixth one that you're going to hear is that Brian is lazy. I've heard that one, which I, again, I don't quite understand that one. Uh, I'm somehow lazy because I spend, you know, seven days a week most times uh, working in the ministry, um, answering people's questions, putting out videos, uh, just giving so much of my time, and I do it all for free. <laughs> Where have you ever heard uh, me charging for anything? Come check me out on Patreon and stuff like this, or you know, you go and you watch my videos and it's ads coming up or something like that. You know, this ministry has always survived by people saying, God's placed it on my heart to give you, you know, money towards this ministry. I've never asked for money. I've never come out and said, you know, you will give money, you will, you have to give money or something like this. I don't do that. I explain what the Bible says, what the Bible teaches about giving to a ministry. Absolutely. But again, to say I'm lazy. I've worked a lot of different jobs in my life. Again, I have a whole video on my past you know, jobs I've had. And I've worked a lot of jobs. They're easy compared to this. I mean, when you're dealing with emotional things and spiritual things and you're getting attacked all the time and just, you know, my word. I used to, when I worked different secular jobs, you leave the job, you know, you're watching the clock and you go, and you, know, you hear the, you know, and that's the end of the day. And you go, oh, great. You go in and you get your lunchbox and you go over and you, you know, I worked in a factory for a while. You go and you do your time card thing and you go, oh boy, you walk out to your vehicle, put your lunchbox down, start your vehicle up. I'm done with work for today. There isn't anything like that when you're in ministry. There is no time when you are done with work, so to speak. Uh, there's times when you can take time off, but I mean, 
uh, as far as just go enjoy yourself. I mean, the, the good day video, we went and enjoyed ourselves, but I mean, the whole way down, the whole way back, we're talking about the Bible. We're talking about what about this person, sister so and so said this. What do you, how do you think I should answer that? Or how does that make me lazy? And people say, oh, I'm afraid to have a real job. Um, watch the stuff about my past. I've had plenty of quote unquote real jobs. And how is this not a real job? So, and you know, the fact that I do a lot of my own construction work, a lot of my own vehicle work and things like this too, but I'm lazy. So, but I just wanted to bring that out because I know some people are just like, he's not answering these videos, you know, and it's like the enemies of this ministry just hate my guts and they're always wanting to come out with new stuff and whatever else. And I, I try to provide them with some good material every once in a while just to, you know, give them a purpose in life. You know, but uh, so I just wanted to make this little thing. If you're new to this ministry and you hear um, you just type my name in or something like that, it'll come up with so many things. I remember this one. Uh, there's one recently here. I heard that uh, I'm a reptilian Amish modalist. Well, that one gets the award, you know, for uniqueness and creativity. I haven't had a good one like that in a while, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm, according to some of the people, I'm a, I'm a crypto Jew. I work for the Mossad. Um, I'm CIA. I'm under mind control. I had one person actually call me Satan. And I said, you know, you know you're just calling. And they, they, no, you're actually, they believed I was Satan. I thought that was interesting, too. Um, you know, I think that Satan would have a more popular YouTube channel than mine, but I don't know. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, and, I, and again, another reason why I'm doing this video is just, you know, not only to explain to new viewers some of the big attacks that you're going to hear on me and just to explain what they mean, but also just to encourage you as a Christian out there, uh, you're going to get hit. You're going to get kicked. Um, you're just going to, that's going to just part of it, you know, be encouraged. Uh, you know, the Lord will, you'll, you'll get into some battles sometimes and, and things where you just think to yourself, you get hit hard. And you just think, I'm not going to be able to recover from this one. And you just say, well, I guess I better just quit and do something else or whatever because I just can't seem to, you know. And the Lord will come along and He'll encourage you. He'll pick you back up, set you back on your feet, go on. <laughs> you know, He's done that for me so many times, lost count. Um, so uh, just thank you to all the friends out there, the ministry and, and everything else uh, that keep us going. And that's going to be it for now. Thank you for watching.